Hey everybody, welcome to week three of Conservation Psychology. My name is Josh O'Neill. I'm uh, here from the Litter Club, this way. And, uh, and we have, we've been discussing over the last couple of weeks psychology, conservation psychology. We started off in week one about understanding psychology itself and where conservation psychology fits into there. And then also the week after looking at social psychology, how we are socially impacted by other people, how we, what we consider as normal, do what we consider as normal. And then this week, we're gonna look at genetic behavior. So how our genes maybe affect what we do. Now, this course goes for six weeks and, uh, and it's a sharing of some information uh, that I went through in, in my course for conservation psychology. And I wanna share it as, especially to companies and NGOs who are looking at getting greater engagement from the people that they are working with and from the community that they want to spread out to. And, you know, I run a couple of non-profit organizations in Singapore and Malaysia, and we, we, we have to work to ensure that we look after our volunteers and we get volunteers to help us do what we're doing. Now, I do have a presentation. It, I'm going to share this with you. So let me just see. Now, there is quite a few words on this as we go through. So please appreciate and understand uh, that you can read it, you can fast forward, you can uh, read, but I'm just going to give you some more localized descriptions as to as we go through as to how it may affect you if you're running a, a non-profit organization or if you're looking specifically at waste management, that whole area around litter, which we do at the Litter Club. Uh, so as you can see, my name is Josh O'Neill. I hope you can see that. Uh, and if you've not listened to the other two webinars so far, I'm the founder of the Lizard Club in Singapore and Malaysia. I'm also a member of the American uh, Psychological Association, specifically Division 34, and that deals with environment, population, and conservation psychology. I'm also a certified green project manager and a certified change management professional, uh, as well as being a dive instructor and, uh, and a Toastmaster. Uh, which is something I love to do because that allows me to mentor others in being able to change behavior, which is really what conservation psychology is all about. So thank you for joining me. Uh, just to let you understand my why, my why, the reason I do this is to actually inspire others to change their conservational behavior. And this is really about you just, just so that people can identify and understand why maybe they do things. And this is why I did the course because I just was like, why do people litter? And I really wanted to find out more. So that's my why and why I'm doing this. So today we're going to look at uh, behavioral genetics. We're gonna look at some stone age biases, some biophilia and some restorative effects of nature and connectedness with nature. So I've got a little bit of a tickle in my throat today. So let's just see how we go. Might need to uh, moisten every now and then. So let's look at the basic principles of evolution. So we look at evolution, <coughs> excuse me, and natural selection. Yeah, so the difference between how we evolve and then that whole, uh, I guess, Darwinism you can think of and the natural selection. Now, adaptation to the physical environment leads to an organism to be more likely to survive. And humans are very good at this. We, we, have, a, an, a, we have an adaptive characteristic and that passes along through generations and how do we continue to survive? A little bit like COVID, uh, very adaptive, very quickly. Uh, humans, not maybe so much, um, but very quickly to how, we, how it can continue to survive and infect as many hosts as possible. So this natural selection that we have uh, leads to the greater survival of organisms that can adapt quickly to their environment. So we're talking about behavioral genetics today, and this is the study of inherent inheritance, uh, inheritance of behavioral traits. So do we actually inherit some of the things that we do when it comes to conservation? And so what are they? Now we look at some of our stone age biases. So we're here today because our ancestors were able to survive and reproduce. And uh, that's why the dinosaurs aren't here, but somehow we managed to, uh, to make it through. We were able to survive, reproduce, and then our brains are quite adapted. So we try and fit ourselves to the demands of the actual environment that we're in. And of course, we have incredible environment happening around us at the moment. Um, we're adaptive uh, in the past. 
but it does not necessarily mean that we're adaptive today. Maybe uh, with the incredible increase in infrastructure, technology, et cetera, uh, we may still have a stone age brain, uh, basically, uh, when it comes to our environmental problem. But maybe we can use them to actually solve the issues that we have. So we look at five evolved psychological biases. These are, as we've evolved, these are typically five areas where we have we have biases. We, of course, immediately have self-interest, which means that we pri prioritize that personal over collective. Uh, so this is survival of the fittest and we must win. We also have uh, a pretty much a short-sightedness. We value the present more than the future. We don't understand the future, we continue to plan for it and say, well, we're gonna do this in five years time, uh, but we're more interested in what we're going to do uh, later, whether it's you know, go to the mall or do a beach cleanup or whatever that is. We're also uh, evolved to be quite status seeking. Uh, and this can be relative status seeking uh, and more important than absolute. Uh, so this is spending money to buy a new car, having the latest phone, et cetera. Uh, and then, of course, we do social imitation, so copying the behaviour of others around around us, and that is uh, ensuring that 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 we are recognised, that we are identified, etc. And some of these things you might find on social media, um, where we do a lot of imitation, and people will follow, and it'll be a trend. Uh, and then, of course, we have sensitising, uh, and that's prioritising threats uh, that we are salient and present, so we're all the time ready by flight, things that we can see, smell, and touch. Um, so that's very much uh, the, the evolved psychological biases. Now, this is a, a hang of a lot to try and read here, um, but essentially this is around how the biases and the, the framework for environmental conversation and uh, behavioural change. And this one, uh, I, I can share all you need to do is connect with me. Uh, but it basically says the constraints for a behavioural change. So what, what, what are the constraints? What's stopping us changing this behaviour? Now, if we look at something like status, uh, people value relative over absolute status. So persuading an individual to uh, accept the lower relative status uh, associated with environmental con conservation. So you know, if I'm a CEO of a major bank or I'm a CEO of a, a non-profit environmental organisation, where is the status uh, in that? And that's an obstacle because I don't really want to be seen as being a CEO of an environmental organization. What are the opportunities that people value environmental behaviors if they, if they come with a status increase? And so if you are seen to be head of you know, WWF or Greenpeace or, or some of these, then, then there is, a, there is a, a status behind that as a recognition. And then examples of promising influences. Uh, this is increasing relative status of green products by making them more visible, highly uh, quality and costly, uh, and costly to obtain the published ranking of the greenest companies. Yeah, so this ensures that your your company is recognised, and you being the head of that company is recognised, and your status, of course, increases with that. Um, and I think that that if you if you go through each one, it's quite interesting. Self interest, prioritising the the, pers the personal uh, over the collective, and then persuading individuals to value the collective more than their own interests. We are very self-absorbed and we're very self-interested. Uh, so it's quite difficult to persuade people to come and be part of the, the collective. And that's persuading people to come and do a beach cleanup. But the opportunities are people cooperate with kin and, and reciprocal social relationships. If I'm able to make new friends, new contacts, new networks, etc., then maybe I will come along uh, to, uh, to the beach cleanup. So you can see use of kin, uh, cues to extract environmental donations, and then create programs where environmental choice results in direct personal gain and create strong, stable communities to foster conservation. So this really is about ensuring that you are identifying as an organization what's in it for, I'm gonna say me, but what's in it for them, the people that you want to come and join. So what, so what direct personal gain would they get? Uh, will they be given a certificate? Will they, uh, be identified on social media? Uh, will they get their photo taken with the mayor, uh, et cetera? If some of these things are uh, available, uh, then they will help to motivate people to come and join your, your beach cleanup. 
Okay, so we're looking at biophilia, and this is uh, this is this this is really pertinent to what we're talking about, I guess, in regards to uh, cleaning up litter, and that is our love of nature, now our natural natural love of nature. Um, so people have an innate need to be near plants, animals, and other aspects of nature. We we grow plants, we have pets, we we go for nature, we go for walks by the river, by the ocean, uh, etc. We need to be connected to nature, and we are directly connected to nature, although sometimes we think we're not. We have a deprivation of this uh, contact will actually lead to a decreased physical and psychological health. So, you know, we become sick if we just live purely in a built up environment, if we do not connect with nature, if we don't go down the local park um, or take our dog there or do things, uh, it, will, it will impact our physical health and will also impact our psychological health because we, we cut off from that connectedness. To, to nature. So <laughs> there is a, a hypothesis around biophilia. Uh, humans have a genetic evolution based need for deep and intimate association with the natural environment. And that's what conservation psychology is all about, rather than the built environment. And particularly, it's living bio, uh, biota, and that's you know, uh, plants, animals, fish, anything that you can kind of think of. Um, and being able to do that as even people going out and doing fishing for leisure uh, or other, other, other things like that, like scuba diving. So direct and indirect evidence uh, around this. So humans have evolved over millions of years in natural environments. It's only recently that we've started to, to kind of build walls around things and uh, uh, say that this is our piece of land and then look at how we defend that. Because of this, we have a biological disposition to favor clean, safe environments. Lots of food and water because that's how we survive. That's where we've evolved, and that's that's where we that's where we're able to reproduce and uh, continue the species. So people in all parts of the world have animals for pets because we need that con connectivity. We're looking at uh, at how we can be connected uh, into um, into uh, the, the the living world. And all parts of the world, we use plants to enrich our living environments. Uh, I'm currently here in, in Thailand and growing wheatgrass, uh, which is very good for your health, and um, also uh, connects me to nature. Uh, growing up on a farm and growing these things and being around so many animals, uh, sometimes you miss these things. And, and uh, especially if you look around Thailand, there's plants uh, everywhere. Every every house has plants outside. So we choose to recreate also in natural environments. We like to go to our beaches now and go tramping in the forests, et cetera. So we do like to be away from the built up uh, environment and into our natural environment. So some more controlled uh, evidence, I guess, is a tendency uh, for people to show health benefits from nature. So actually when they're, when they're uh, being involved with nature, so there was a study done by Ulrich back in 93 uh, and 97 uh, to give us some, uh, some evidence around that. And basically people were, were exposed to a stressful situation and if, that we measured their, their heart rate, their blood pressure, et cetera, and then randomly assigned them a view of a picture of a built environment or a natural environment. And uh, it was quite prevalent that stress reduced a lot faster when we looked at a picture of nature compared to when we looked at a picture of a building or a city uh, or a built up, a built up environment. Uh, so we, we do connect with nature. Our, we inherently want to connect with nature. Uh, in fact, we need to, um, it's, it's born into us. So uh, for organizations like the Litter Club, we give the opportunity for people to be able to connect to nature. And that's, uh, that's part of what we do from a psychological point of view in the sense that we offer, not a beach cleanup, but we offer the opportunity to connect with nature. Uh, sorry, lots of words on here. Let me flick through them, but this is about the restorative effects of actual nature. So hundreds of studies done that people hiking or camping uh, have a lot greater reduced stress. Now think about when you go into nature and why you go there, et cetera. Uh, and you will probably find also I go and sit on the beach to release my stress. I go for a walk in the park to do the same. They found that, that people recovered faster from surgery when they were exposed to natural environments. They did a, a, a study where they had 23 people recovering from gallbladder surgery. 23 they put into, uh, into a room with 
lovely view of trees um, out from their hospital bed. Uh, the other had a view of brick wall and the view of trees associated with less pain, uh, more positive mood and, he, and even faster discharge. So, you know, these are the things that we look at from a psychological point of view as to what is the impact that it has on us as, as, uh, as humans and what does then, what, how does that affect our behaviours? So we have a preference, again, pictures of nature. People prefer pictures of natural environments to those of built up environments. And I think this is something I've just covered. Um, this is even true for mundane pictures, just an open field versus uh, a, a wonderful urban, urban scene. Um, and uh, pictures of natural scenes with water, of course, rank very high. Being a scuba diver, I understand the, the, the reason behind that. But even Savannah hypothesis people should prefer images linked with biological evolution. So the savannas, the grasslands, small cups of trees, etc. Um, this is a hypothesis that that uh, as we as we evolve, um, these are the images that have been implanted and genetically implanted. So it brings us on to our connectedness with nature. So this is about inclusion. So an individual's belief about the extent to which she or he believes that they are part of the natural environment. And some people sadly think that they are not part of the natural environment. They don't need the natural environment. Uh, I can just work in an office all day. I can go home to my condo. I can eat in a restaurant down the road um, and I don't need to, to, to head outdoors. Um, uh, but you do uh, because uh, cognitive connectedness and we, we spoke about this in the previous, uh, previous month. That's a connectedness between yourself and nature, um, effective to the extent to which you care about it. And then, of course, that drives the behavior that you have towards nature. So that's the commitment in the ways that you will act to benefit the natural environment. So how will you do that? So, so if I feel very connected to nature because I do a lot of stuff out in nature, might, I might be golfing, I might be scuba diving, uh, I might be tramping or trekking, etc. If I do a lot of that stuff and I feel quite connected to nature um, and uh, I care about nature, so I see litter on the side of the track uh, or on the side of the, the golf course or something like that, and I care about that, then it will affect my behavior because more than likely I will go and pick it up. So what we're looking at is how we now connect, start connecting these dots to getting people to actually be more engaged in the cleanups that we're doing. And that's the inclusion model. So you've got your connectedness, how connected are you? How much do you care? That gives you the level of commitment that you're going to get from somebody. Um, and, and that's their behavior. That's the behavior. So connectedness with nature to the extent to which uh, cognitive elements are linked reflects the extent to which concepts are associated. So self, identity, and culture. So how we look to ourselves, uh, how we identify externally and the culture that we're actually part of. So there's more and more data showing that psychological and behavioral consequences of connectedness with nature. If we are not connected, then there is issues. Uh, and we seem to have a smaller and smaller group of people really being connected, really being connected to nature. And we have a lot more people being aware uh, of environmental issues, but not necessarily being connected to nature and getting it out from nature. Uh, and we've just had two years of being locked up uh, inside and away from nature. Uh, so very much at the Litter Club, we say to people, let's bring you back out to, um, to nature and get you involved again so that uh, you get outside so that you can see and enjoy. And by the way, we're doing a beach cleanup. So there's more work leading on, uh, on factors that lead to connectedness. So, what can make us feel more connected? And you know, we can look at things like zoos and aquariums, where you where we bring a connectivity into a controlled environment, and that which is which is an, another area of study within within this kind of environmental psychology, uh, and and it's quite an it's quite an interesting uh, 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 area of study. How do people? react when they go to an aquarium and why do we have aquariums and I was very much of the of the as a diver we don't need aquariums they're, they're terrible and they're horrible and we don't need zoos um, but sometimes uh, I have to to look at the other side of it as well and say how can I ensure that 
that our youth are being connected in some which way or form because our built up environment is becoming bigger and it's harder for many people to actually leave that built up environment and go to a natural environment and be able to experience and connect to nature. So if we can bring nature to them in a controlled way, uh, there's, there's, there's positives and negatives to that. Um, but as long as it's done in the right way, then any way that we can get people uh, involved in uh, being connected to nature is, is important. So this goes back to what we were talking about before. This is inclusion, um, and this is how connected we are, and that gives us that bi a biospheric motive. So this is psychological inclusion. Um, so this is how we get people included, connect them to nature. That will tell us how their behavior uh, is. Uh, if you have less inclusion, then you feel separate from nature. You're not feeling included. You're not feeling connected. You can have a more egoistic, uh, which is a yourself, uh, self-motivated uh, thing and then how do we get you to that point of behavior as well and uh, and this is the area that I like to work in around that egoistic motive how do we work with that to be able to get people more engaged to uh, to be involved in beach cleanups and other aspects of uh, of what we do from an environmental point of view Uh, last one, I think on connectedness with nature, knowledge is coded in memory as a hierarchical cognitive network. So we do have knowledge which is passed on to us inherently uh, through hierarchy and through, through genetics. Uh, the extent of the cognitive balance uh, link reflects the extent to which concepts are associated. So schemas and cell schemas, how we, how we see them, how we connect. Uh, and you know, continuously living in a built up environment versus growing up on a farm, moving to a, uh, a built-up environment, or growing up on a farm and living on a farm for the rest of your life provides a different, different schemas there. So that, and different connectedness. So that uh, connectedness refers to association between myself schema and the schema for nature. So this looks at an established theory, eliminate the barriers between nature and experience, and then we connect with nature. Now, this could be something like, uh, like a zoo, uh, where we take away the barriers between nature and the experience. We just let people connect. I like to think of it from a litter club where we actually let people get outside. Um, we remove the bar barriers between nature and, and experience because they're right there. They're being involved and doing it at the same time. So nature and experience is connected. We can provide a direct encounter. So encounters with people can promote changes in attitudes and behavior. By getting people to come along to a beach cleanup, we can actually help to change uh, attitudes and behaviors. We remember that just by changing an attitude does not necessarily change a behavior, and by changing behavior does not necessarily change an attitude. People can uh, be illogical when it comes to doing this, but the opportunity is there and we can promote changes. And then the personal experience usually provides a stronger effect. So it's not mediated by technology, et cetera. Uh, and uh, it means that once I've seen the litter uh, that is on the beaches in Singapore, uh, not the beaches, but in the mangroves, etc. cetera, um, then I, it has a more profound effect on me rather than I see a photo of it. Uh, and then of course, uh, the increased engagement, which I mentioned before, appealing to that egoistic motivational bias. So how can we get people motivated from their own self motivation? So that, that leads us through the, uh, through the, the thoughts of genetic and, and, and genetics and why we, we essentially do things because of the way that they've been done previously uh, and because of the genetic knowledge that has been passed and transferred through to us. So understanding, I guess, really, uh, if I boil it down to, to one sentence, is truly understanding what motivates us, whether it's, uh, and, and how connected we are to nature. If we are connected and we do care about nature, then our behavior will be to protect and look after it more. If we are less connected and, uh, and therefore we don't care, we will not do as much for nature. So working in our space, how do we get people more connected to nature by giving them the experience, by getting them, you can say, the bum off seat uh, and into, the, into nature and give them an experience uh, that benefits them. And that's the area that I, I like working in. And, and that involves many facets, marketing, uh, visuals, um, and other areas within psychology. So I hope you've enjoyed this quick update uh, for 
uh, for our week three insights into behavioral genetics. Uh, thank you so much for joining. We will be back next week uh, and, to, and then we'll identify how to overcome barriers. And this, is, this really is about the next step from those behavioral genetics we're talking about, where there is barriers in there, the obstacles for people to actually do things and, 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 and their behaviors. And we're going to look at that the week after awareness of recycling your waste and then how to consume sustainability and appreciate philanthropy, which every nonprofit and NGO out there desperately needs. So thank you so much. If you do have any questions, you can message me at any time. Uh, of course, my name is Josh O'Neill. You can contact me, Josh, at the litterclub.org uh, or my WhatsApp or line number plus six six in Thailand, nine six six three nine six. Two five two. Thank you so much. Take care. Stay safe and stay well. <laughs>